you have the public library. Um, I'm going to add a disclaimer if you didn't hear me earlier. I'm not a ghost hunter. Um, I have no experience you know, with any sort of equipment being out in the field looking at anything. My interest in ghost stories is from a local history perspective. Um, I, I read nonfiction. I think truth is stranger than fiction. And whether you believe ghost stories or not, I think they always have an interesting story behind them. Um, they often have an interesting story behind them. Some things are just unexplained, but uh, um, as I tell some of these stories, I, I hope you take that away, that whether you believe these or not, I think it's just really good stories. Um, so that's, that's why I'm interested in this. Um, I've got a couple stories from Ephrata, a couple from Adamstown. Uh, depending on what kind of time I have, um, I'm hoping this will go 45 minutes to an hour. Depending on what kind of time I have, um, I may venture uh, into Lancaster a little bit, over to Chickie's Rock. Um, there's some really good stories out that way. Um, but uh, I will say, when I, I decided to put this together, I really thought there would be more ghost stories than there were. And there's a few places that I was convinced would be haunted, but they're really not. Um, at least not in sort of a current sense. Um, first place I'm going to talk about is the effort of Loyster. And I was convinced that it's got to be haunted. There's got to be ghost stories there. And there are, but they're not really, they're not really modern ghost stories. They're ghost stories from the 1700s. Um, the society, the religious society there was founded in 1732. It's 280 years old. The, the, the facility there um, dates back to uh, 1732. It was founded by a gentleman named Johann Conrad Bunsen. Um, if you know anything about him, he was something of a mystic. He, uh, without going too much into the history of the cloister, they, they were a little bit different. They had what were called watch night services. They would wake up in the middle of the night, the night and basically wait for the second coming of Christ. They would be up from like midnight to three in the morning. Uh, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning rolled around. If nothing happened by then, they could go back to sleep and they'd wake up for the next night. So if you think about it, they all wore white robes. They're all up at two o'clock in the morning. Men would be in one chapel, women would be in another. Uh, that would be this thing here, that's called the Saul. Um, I would think that there would be some spirit of somebody over there wandering around, but that just isn't the case. But at the time, um, there was a story that Conrad Weiss himself, after he died in 1768, he would appear to members. That's his grave right there. He's buried over in the little cemetery out, uh, right off the 322 of God's Acre. He would, he would haunt people. He actually was um, suspected to have attacked two members uh, at some point. Uh, I don't quite know what that means, but he attacked people. Um, the most famous effort of ghost story actually took place in Virginia, but there's a really strong effort of time. Um, and this is, this is one of those where I really like to say truth is stranger than fiction. The, the story is, is really good. Um, there was a man by the name of Christoph uh, Beal, or Bolin. He was married three times. The first wife, um, and he lived in Ephraim. They were householders. They were not members of the celibate order that actually lived on the grounds, but they were essentially members of the church. He and another woman moved to Virginia. First wife joined the celibate order. She died in 1741, freeing Christoph to marry the, what would become the second wife in Virginia. The second wife died in 1758, freeing him up to marry third wife. So through, while he was in the, the Blue Mountain um, area of Virginia, he became proper. He became relatively affluent. Well, after he married the third wife, 1761 rolls around. The second wife's ghost started haunting, sorry, the yeah, second wife's ghost started haunting the living third wife. 
Um, some, I, I, I read one source that said it had something to do with buried treasure. Um, the third wife had Christoph fill out a will. And some say that that sort of triggered something. Um, eventually, the first wife's ghost got involved, too. So you have the ghost of the first wife and the second wife haunting the third wife. And they went up to Ephrata, Christoph and his third wife, they went up to Ephrata, and there was actually a seance that went on, a seance, a reconciliation. There was some sort of spiritual meeting that went on with Conrad Weissel, a daughter of the first wife and a daughter of the second wife, and a couple members of the order. And it actually took inter the intervention of, uh, of uh, Conrad Weissel to basically make the, the ghost of the first and second wife go away. Um, Nagging beyond the grave, apparently. Um, but they, uh, that's the most famous story. It's, it's called um, um, the, the Haunting of Long March or something, something to that effect. Um, the other most famous haunted place here in Ephrata, and you can't talk haunted the Calico Valley without talking uh, Mount Springs Hotel at Camp Silver. Camp Silver Bell started at what is now Greater Park in 1932. <clears throat> there were some spiritualists from Florida. I believe it was Myron and um, Ethel Post is their name. Right? Parish, Parish Post. I believe it was originally Post. Eventually it was Parish Post. They came up here. They were invited up here by some friends. Uh, they liked it and stayed. They were at Greater Park. They essentially took the park over. The park was run as a corporation. There were stockholders. The stockholders, some of them sold to the spiritual group. The spiritual group basically ran the park. It had been the, the town park. You, know, you could go and have your picnic there. There was a baseball field there. Um, the spiritualists took it over. Well, that didn't sit well with the locals. So eventually the spiritualists were kicked out. And they moved to the Mountain Springs Hotel, which I'm sure you all know, but it's the, uh, it's the hotel. Uh, the Hampton Inn currently sits there. The part of the building still exists. Most of it was torn down in 2004. Um, but that, that hotel had existed since about 1850. Uh, up on the mountain, there's uh, water. It was um, it was a place you would go, you would take the waters, kind of like Sulphur Springs, uh, West Virginia. Um, <coughs> you would go, the waters were said to have healing properties. Uh, this, was, this was a very popular <coughs> hotel through about the turn of the century. Um, uh, Milton and Kitty Hershey were known to visit. Uh, James Buchanan and Thaddeus Stevens were known to vi visit. It's most likely incorrect. It's almost certainly incorrect. But there are there are stories that U.S. Grant was there, Abraham Lincoln was there, um, George B. McClellan was there. Um, these are almost certainly uh, not true. But the laundry list of people that visited there is locally fairly famous. Um, around the the depression, the hotel started to decline. So the hotel was for sale. In um, roughly, it was 1935, the spiritualists bought the hotel. And they operated it as a summer hotel until 1987. Um, the facility changed hands. It changed names. 1976, it went from Camp Silverbelt to the Temple of Drew. Um, the spiritualists believed in uh, manifestation, uh, speaking trumpets. I really don't want to go into that part too much. Um, to say the least, it, it was an interesting group. Um, and there's a, there's a really good book written uh, a couple years ago uh, by Clarence Spong that really goes into the history of the Mountain Springs Hotel really well. Um, but they, uh, they were there until 1987. The building sat empty until 2004. There were a number of different attempts to revive it. But the, the stories at the time were that if you would go in there, you could hear footsteps, you would see shadows darting around. Um, there was a, uh, apparently a room in the basement. Um, uh, 
is used um, by an occult group. Um, local ghost hunters tried to get in there. They were denied access because it was an unsafe building. Um, the liability was just too high. But uh, um, I'm sure you've all seen pictures that look like this. Um, this is a uh, this is a uh, picture of uh, a materialization session, I guess. Um, there's a whole series of pictures like this, and you know we started out with just sort of a mist, and I think this is the last one. But this is Silver Bell. This is the spirit guide of uh, uh, of um, Apple Parish folks. Um, I, 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 I'm not going to comment beyond that. I'll let you make your own decisions. But uh, certainly, the, the, the Mount Springs Hotel was a was a, an interesting place, and um, I, I realized this the other day. Effort was founded in 1732. The Effort of Cloister. That um, the last celibate member of that order died in 1813. There was a group called the Seventh. German Seventh Day Baptist Brethren, something like that, that took over. And they ran that site until um, 1934 is when they finally dissolved. I, I find it a little ironic that while the effort of Cloister was sort of shutting down in 1934, from 1932 to 1935, that three or four year window, literally right across the creek, is when the spiritualists of Camp Silverbell and then the Temple of Truth kind of took over. So you, you almost have a, uh, and for lack of a better term, it almost seems you have a handoff. The one ends at the same time right across the creek, the other is started. So basically, here in Ephrata, we have had a major spiritual group from roughly 1732 up until 1987. So you had almost a 250-year continuum of groups like this being here in Africa. And certainly the two groups are, are fundamentally very different, but um, there's some similarities to draw between the two. So um, these, are, these are easily the two biggest uh, here in Africa. But uh, again, I'll, I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Um, so let's see here. Locals, uh, I should point out, locals call, uh, call the hotel the spooks, or the spook house, um, when it was vacant. Um, Chris Wolf, um, a local ghost hunter, he wrote a, a book called um, uh, Ghosts of Hershey. Uh, it was 2009, 2009, 2010. And he's, his, he's got a chapter called Here Yet, where I'm drawing a lot of this from. But uh, he went there one day before they tore the hotel down, and he was taking pictures out front. And um, he's got pictures in that book, and he says, well, you know, if you look in, in the upper windows, um, you know, you see someone with a baseball cap on. And, and he says that some of the, the, uh, it was the shutters were moving. It wasn't a windy day. Um, I, uh, I, I don't even remember the, the hotel being up that direction. Unfortunately, it's a little before my, my interest in this kind of thing. But uh, uh, moving on. The effort of, uh, there's a, a couple of other stories here in Ephrata. Uh, first is the Ephrata Monument, which is the, the big obelisk that sits up off of uh, Mill Road in the cemetery right above the uh, high school there. That monument is the marks the resting place of 100, 150 um, Continental soldiers that were uh, killed at the Battle of Brandywine, or wounded at the Battle of Brandywine, were brought here to Ephrata to receive care at the Cloister. This was uh, 1777. If you haven't been to Brandywine, they have an interesting little park. I was there Friday as well. Um, but. Uh, the battle there was September 11, 1777. They were brought here to Ephrata to receive medical care. The uh, cloister had a reputation as being fairly cutting edge for medical care, which is why they dragged these wounded men uh, like 50 miles, something like that, 
So they dragged them up here, and unfortunately some of them didn't survive. That's where they're buried, under that monument. The legend there is that on certain nights, you can see um, individuals dressed in revolutionary garb, essentially guarding that, that monument and that site. And uh, I get that story from Chris Wolf as well. Um, the Old Bethel Seminary, it's on uh, Parkview Heights Road outside of town. It's uh, this cemetery right here. It's uh, next to the um, Effort of Manor, I believe it is. Um, it's, uh, it's part of uh, Bethany United Church of Christ. They own it. The church itself is here in Effort of, but the ghost story there is there was a 29-year-old girl who died on her uh, wedding day. Her name is Sarah Wells. She's buried in her um, buried in her wedding dress, but uh, she died on her wedding day. She was the daughter of the minister of the church. Her uh, her ghost is said to haunt the uh, the cemetery. Um, I'm not sure which one's her grave, but um, that's the cemetery. Um, it's all over this country, but uh, it's up there by the. Uh, Effort of Manor. Um, I am going to take a, a, a quick side trip down to uh, a cemetery in Lancaster because there's a similar story that takes place in uh, Lancaster Cemetery, which is the big one here, um, Lancaster General Hospital. It's right next to St. Mary's Cemetery. There's a tombstone down there to Augusta Bittner. She died in 1906. Um, she's known she's known as the walking tombstone. Um, her tombstone is, it's a, a statue of a woman, kind of, it looks like she's stepping down from uh, a couple of steps, and there's a, a broken column beside her. The, the story there is, on certain nights, some say it's Halloween, some say it's the night she died, uh, some say it's full moon, that her statue gets up and walks around. And I've, I've read some accounts of people who have said, yeah, you know, we've seen that happen. Um, the story there is she supposed, that, there's, there's a couple stories. She died on the way to her wedding. She died in childbirth. Um, similar things. Um, historically, that's not correct. Uh, she died of typhoid, I think. Um, there's no mystery to that. Um, you know, historically, we can trace that she died of natural causes. She did have a daughter, um, had nothing to do with her death. She didn't fall in her head. But uh, she did, her, her last name was Tevis, her married name. But her tombstone does not say that. It says it cost a bit. Her parents paid for the tombstone. And it, it cost them a lot of money. It was, I believe at the time, it was $23,000, which is a, a, a ton of money for 1906. But she, uh, it's a ton of money for today. Um, but uh, apparently the parents didn't like who she was marrying very much. Um, the stories, I think, largely revolve around an inscription that's on the tombstone. Uh, her tombstone says, could love have kept her. That's inscribed. And, and there was really never any explanation as to why they put that on there. But uh, that's, uh, that's the most famous story from that cemetery. Um, the cemetery next door, just as a side note, there was a, an incident there in 1994 where a woman called the police and said a Civil War soldier was shooting a, a gun off in the cemetery. Uh, the police investigated and they didn't find anything, <laughs> so they, they didn't file a report. But uh, these kinds of things still happen. Um, let's see, the Everett Rec Center. This is another story I get from Chris Wolf. Um, there was a man who used to go there every morning to um, swim. And doors open at 6 a.m. He would get there early before he'd go off to work. So um, he got to know some of the other people who would go in there early and work out and you know, socialize with them. So his name was Mike. That's what we call him. And I get this one from Chris Wolf, too. Um, he uh, went in to swim one day. Uh, he was running late. He would always see a guy named George there. He was used to seeing George. He waved to George. So one day he was running late. He went in, uh, woke up, 
jumped in the car, drove a couple blocks to the rack, um, and I uh, saw George. George waved to him. Guy went inside, uh, changed, you know, was ready to jump in the pool, and there was a sign on one of the lanes saying, um, you know, this is closed in memory of George. And uh, Mike was really confused, kind of scratched his head and said, I just saw George outside. So he went around and talked to a couple of people, and he found out that George died on Friday. And uh, he's really not sure um, who he saw, but he, he's pretty saw he sure saw George's ghost up at the wreck outside. So um, George was definitely dead. A um, couple of haunted house stories. Um, someone here at the library told me a story uh, one morning about her um, apartment, her current apartment. Um, her daughter has seen a man in the hallway while she's eating breakfast, and uh, there were several times when she was making noises to her cat, and she heard the same noises back, and it wasn't from the cat. Uh, the same patron told me about a home she used to live in on Locust Street. Um, it was in her uh, ex-husband's family for years. One time in the early 2000s, she was in the basement. Uh, she heard footsteps coming down the stairs. She thought it was her then husband. She turned around and there was no one there. Uh, so that's a house on Locust Street. Uh, that, uh, yeah, that, that I don't know. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, five beasts like this. Okay, thanks. Okay. Did I get that roughly correct? Kind of. Kind of. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there is a small house in the Lincoln section of Ephrata. Lincoln was originally called New Ephrata. It was renamed in the 1860s after President Lincoln. Um, and since then, it has basically been swallowed up. If you know where Lincoln is, it's you know, west of Ephrata on 322, the west side of Ephrata on 322, um, yeah, 322 um, west of uh, Reading Road. But uh, um, Chris Wolf, use him a lot. Uh, he uh, he moved into a, uh, into a home on Apple Drive, I believe it is, with a, a, a then girlfriend. He was awakened one night to the sound of a, a dry erase board that they had kept on their fridge to leave each other messages. To the sound of that hitting the floor, and the the weird thing about that was. It did fall down. It was about 10 feet away. It was like somebody ripped it, ripped it down. Some of the magnets were still attached to the refrigerator. Um, it, it just it didn't fall. And it, it woke him up one night, and he went into the, room, the kitchen. They had cats. The cats wouldn't go with it. They uh, they stayed outside. So they apparently knew something that he didn't. Um, that's house story number two. House story number three. There's an old uh, mill and farmhouse south of Ephrata that friends of, of Chris Wolf used to own. The grounds of the, of the, the farmhouse and the old mill uh, are said to be haunted by the miller who uh, built the uh, built the structures. Um, he is said to have hung himself. He got depressed one day and he hung himself. Um, Chris was uh, um, staying there one time. And uh, he heard somebody whisper in his ear. <coughs> he was house sitting. There was no one else in the house. It's uh, a man, woman, and two teenage daughters that had lived there, but they weren't there. He heard someone whisper in uh, his ear something to the effect of, is that you, Poppy? Um, the family would also smell perfume, uh, lavender perfume. And he smelled lavender perfume that night. Um, Haunted house number four is back in uh, Lincoln. There's an old farmhouse there that currently houses the offices of a leap coach. The second floor is apartments. Uh, there's two. And uh, a guy named Jack moved into the one apartment. And a few months later, a guy named Frank moved into the other. Um, Jack and Frank worked opposite schedules, but you know they pass each other. You know they would say hi. They knew each other. Um, <coughs> the interior walls of the apartment weren't real thick, so if one you know would have his TV too loud, the other would just knock on the wall and 
turn it down and vice versa. So one day, uh, let's see, it was uh, Jack. Jack would often hear Frank come home from work. And you could always tell it was him coming home because he would hear heavy work boots coming up the steps that led to their apartment, that led to the doors. And uh, he would hear work boots coming up the steps, and then he would hear keys jingle, and Jack would, uh, Frank would be home. So uh, one night, Jack heard from the same step, boots coming up the steps, keys jingle, you know, someone went into the apartment, he heard someone walking around. So the next morning, uh, Jack, was about to leave his apartment, walked down steps, and saw Frank moving out. So he, he approached, and uh, it actually wasn't Frank. It was his uh, twin brother, Tom. Tom and his father were there, and they, they, uh, they uh, told Jack the bad news. Frank died the day before. Um, he, was at his, he was in his hometown of Wilmington, Delaware, and he was crossing the street and got hit by a car. And uh, you know, Jack was Jack was, you know, he asked, well, you know, I, I heard him last night, and they said, no, he was he was, you know, he died unfortunately yesterday afternoon. So for the succeeding nights, uh, there was a certain time that uh, Jack would hear work boots on the steps, going up to the apartment, and he would hear keys jingle. Um, every time he opened the door, nobody was there. So he talked to a, a mutual friend, and that friend said, well, you know, maybe you have to tell Frank that he died, and you know, he needs to move on. So one night, uh, that's what Jack did. He heard work boots going up the steps, he heard keys jingle, and uh, he uh, opened the door and said, I'm sorry, Frank, I hate to tell you this, but, and he told him the story, and he said, you know, you need to move along. And uh, he did hear he did hear uh, noises in that apartment uh, periodically, but not as often. And it got less and less. And then eventually, someone else moved in. And then eventually, uh, Jack moved out. But uh, Frank again definitely wasn't making those noises in that apartment. And uh, the first, whenever uh, whenever Jack would hear those uh, footsteps going up the stairs, if he opened the door, it got colder all of a sudden. So uh, that's uh, over in Lincoln, the offices of Elite Coach above there. Uh, it's an old farmhouse. Um, okay, that is the ghost of here in Ephrata. Uh, we're going to go north to Adamstown. And one thing I, I learned doing this was there are ghost stories and there's ghost stories. There are some stories that are like sentence. This place is haunted. And that's the extent of it. And there's others where there's a story where you know, someone's walking down the street and they saw a ghost and this happened and that happened. Um, a lot of ghost stories from Adamstown, um, Ad Adamstown has, has a, a number of ghost stories for a town of its size. Um, a lot of those are just, there are things that wander around Adamstown. So, and you'll have to excuse my clip art, I really didn't know what to use. So. Um, there are headless pigs, a black dog, and a woman in white and black that wander. They just show up in, in uh, uh, Adamstown. The story behind the headless pigs is, for many years, there was a butcher shop located next to the Eckington Distillery. Probably pronounced that wrong, but there was a distillery in uh, Adamstown next to a butcher shop. The distillery would dump its leftover grain over the fence to where the butcher kept hogs. Well, the hogs ate really well, and they got really fat. And eventually, well, their hogs, they got slaughtered. So the theory there is that these fattened pigs that are headless wander around that part of Adamstown uh, because they were fed so. Uh, there's a mysterious black dog that just shows up in, in, in certain parts of Adamstown, and it follows people around. Nobody knows why. Nobody even knows what breed of dog it is. It's just a black dog that follows people around Adamstown. Um, Adamstown's two ghost women. They are Die Weissfrau and Das uh, Schwarzfrau. I, my German's really bad, you'll have to explain that. Um, but essentially, it's a woman in white and a woman in black that are often seen wandering around Adamstown. 
they never look at each other, they never look at anyone, they just walk around, but they're never that far from each other. They're always in the same vicinity. Um, if you follow them, they end up in a cemetery outside of town where they simply disappear. So, um, I, I, I don't have a specific story about somebody who has seen any of these, just they wander around um, out of town. And I, I found no stories like this in, uh, in effort or really um, almost anywhere else where just, you know, certain things just show up certain places. So, um, the Devil's Racetrack. This one involves a fiddler. A lot of ghost stories involve fiddlers. Um, there's a feature outside of Adamstown called the Devil's Racer. Um, this fiddler had a cabin outside of town. <clears throat> this fiddler was known in the community. He would play. Um, he would play at fire halls, weddings, community celebrations, things like that. Um, whatever money he made, he kept in a box at his cabin out in the woods near this land feature known as the Devil's Racetrack. Um, on October 24th, um, I'm not sure what year that was, a long time ago, uh, he was attacked by two robbers when he returned to his cab, and they knew that he had a small stash of money there. Um, he was saving money to bring his mother over from the old country. I'm not sure what country that is, but he was going to bring his mother across to the United States. Um, but uh, these two robbers stopped him. Uh, they were in his house when he returned one night. Um, they demanded to know where his money was. He didn't tell them. Um, so as uh, many of these things go, they killed him, ransacked the house, couldn't find anything. Uh, so they burned the, the cabin down to cover their tracks. Um, it is said um, that in that part of town you can hear uh, fiddle music playing, and it gets louder closer to uh, the night of October 23rd and 24th, and if you're there on October 23rd or October 24th overnight, um, you will see him sitting, sitting playing the fiddle with a small box of money at his feet. Um, last ghost story from Adamstown is uh, Vera Cruz Road. Uh, Vera Cruz Road used to be known as Lard Lane. Um, there's a ghost that wanders the fields along that stretch of road. Um, it just wanders around and then vanishes, and that's the story. There's a ghost there. Uh, nobody really seems to know why. But uh, there's a ghost out that way. So um, that is Ephrata and Adamstown. Um, a couple other regional stories I'm going to touch on. Uh, Cornwall Iron Furnace is up in Lebanon County. Um, this is a really famous story. Essentially, um, one of the early iron masters at Cornwall. Cornwall is a state historic site. It's this right here. Um, essentially, a giant fire uh, where iron was produced. It was produced there. Um, I should know this. Um, 18th and 19th century. Uh, the iron ore that was extracted there was extracted up until the 1970s. Um, when, the, when the furnace was in operation, it was run by an iron master. Some say it was Peter Grubb. Uh, Peter Grubb is um, fairly famous. There's a lake around Mountville named Lake Grubb. I think is named after him. But uh, an iron master is an unquestioned uh, baron of his people. There were iron furnaces all over. South Central PA. Uh, Baron Stiegel is probably one of the more famous ones, um, in addition to his glass making operation. But an iron master really was sort of king of his little little fiefdom. Um, and iron iron furnaces were almost self-contained little operations. Uh, but this iron master, who some say was uh, Peter Grubb, he liked to hunt. So he had a uh, pack of dogs. In this uh, this pack of dogs, he would boast about. He was something of a drunken lout. Um, he would boast about this pack of dogs and their ability to, to hunt game. So one day he had some friends from Philadelphia over, one day, one night, 
and uh, they were out hunting. And his normally really good pack of dogs wasn't doing what he wanted. They weren't producing anything, and some of his friends started to, you know, joke with him about it. You know, well, I thought you said your your hounds were really good. Well, those uh, those hounds weren't producing. It made the Iron Master really mad. Crazy. Um, when he got back to the Iron Furnace, uh, he was enraged. He took all the dogs and he had them thrown in the Iron Furnace, uh, one by one, until the last dog, his favorite. Uh, was still around, and uh, I read one source that said the dog lunged at him. I said one. I read one source that said that the dog, you know, licked his face, and the Iron Master all of a sudden became really nice. Um, but long story short, that dog ended up in the furnace too. The guys, the guys' friends were horrified. You know, how can we do this? Um, this is terrible. Um, well, eventually, the Iron Master sobered up the next morning, came to his senses. Uh, was really remorseful, and the story is that if you're in the woods around Mount Gretna um, or Cornwall, you will often hear um, dogs barking, um, hounds that are still out on the hunt. This is related to a, a story uh, called the Eternal Hunter. Um, it's it's a common story, the Eternal Yager in German. Um, but. Uh, some say this story comes from Governor Dick, the historical character named Governor Dick, who the mountain is named after. But, uh, and this is this is one that you will read a lot of places. There's a lot of different variations. That favorite dog, I've seen it listed. Its name listed as Maggie, Flora, Singing Ann. Um, there's a, a famous poem written about about this. Um, of my my pile of resources up here, I think this story is in about five. Of them. Um, a little closer to home, uh, the Landis House down at Landis Valley. If you're at all familiar with the story of the Landis Valley Farm Museum, it was founded by two brothers, George and Henry. Um, they were born in the 17th of the 1860s. They died in 1940, 1950, something like that. Um, that museum is basically their their uh, life's work. Um, but they they lived in this house here. There's a number of different Landis houses there. It's Landis Valley, for heaven's sakes, and Landis is a fairly common name. But this house in particular is the one that they grew up in. They had a sister named Nettie Mack. Um, she got, or she, uh, she was born years after they were. She's 10, 15 years younger. She was born in uh, the 1870s. Um, she, she passed away in uh, 1914. She was 34. She was uh, sick all her life. Um, but she was doted upon by her parents and her two brothers. But the story is that she haunts this house down at Landis Valley. Um, it's one of those things that the employees there apparently talk about over the water cooler. Um, staff and guides feel uneasy entering the house. There are some that won't even won't even walk in the door. Uh, footsteps are heard in the building. There's a curtain that no matter how many times they try to pin it back, it won't stay where they want it. Um, there's a, a story that the, a tour guide heard music coming from a music box that hadn't been wound in years. Um, it's not even known if the uh, uh, ears would work. Um, they think it's Nettie made because at one point, a woman from out of state who would have no idea who Nettie May was, she had never heard this story, uh, went in and was taking the tour one day. And uh, all of a sudden, she announced that the, that the uh, building was haunted by a young woman who died young and uh, had been sick her entire life. The uh, tour guide was like, oh, OK. Um, but uh, the woman went as far as to say that the spirit's name started with an N. She asked if she could pray for the woman. The tour guide said, well, when we're done. So the woman prayed for uh, the spirit, and uh, that was that. So uh, Lane's Valley is apparently haunted by um, Nettie Mack. And uh, shameless library plug number one is uh, we have free museum passes to both the Africa Cloister 
and uh, Langdon's Valley that can be checked out. And if you have any more questions about those, you can talk to the circulation desk. Shameless plug number one, it's the only one I do. I'm going to do, I swear. Um, let's see. Uh, Pine Town Powder Bridge, that is the one down uh, kind of in the general vicinity of uh, Oregon Dairy on Pine Town Road. It um, has since been washed on its foundations during Tropical Storm Lee. Um, if, if you got here early, uh, before I actually started, I was saying, covered bridges are very prone to be haunted, it seems to me. Um, they're sometimes called crybaby bridges. Um, there's a number of bridges where the story is that uh, a mother drowned her, her child that she had out of wedlock, and you can hear babies crying near, near them. Um, there's a number of examples of that. Um, and there's a number of haunted bridges in South Central PA. But this one in particular, uh, according to local legend, and I try to stay away from things that I read on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of websites that will say, you know, you can submit your ghost story. But this one seemed pretty legit to me, so I went with it. Um, according to local legend, an Amish girl drowned in the Conestoga River while trying to fetch a ball that she, she was bouncing a ball on the bridge. It went down into the water. Apparently, she drowned while trying to recover this ball. The legend is that if you park your car on the bridge at night, which you can't do now, but if you park, if you would park your car there, you could hear a ball bouncing. And if you waited long enough, it would come off your your car hood. And uh, I think this is one where you know if it got close enough, your car won't start or something like that. That, that's another common example. If, if the phenomenon gets close enough, your car won't start. Um, but that's the Pine Town Cover Bridge. Another, another one that I uh, had read on the internet was a, uh, and I, I have no cooperation behind this one. Apparently there's an old tire factory in Terry Hill, which is um, haunted. I saw this three different places on the same website. That's why I gave it a little bit of credence. Uh, apparently, it was an old silent movie house and then a piano repair shop. Uh, one of the claims said that they would see a, a blue face in the window. Um, again, that's in uh, Fair Hill. Um, I do draw some stories from a, a ghost, um, uh, an author from uh, Columbia named Darkie Butts Fidel. Um, she, uh, she tells a story about uh, a Mennonite cemetery in Angletown. And I'm going to use the, the lowercase Mennonite Cemetery in Hangletown. She didn't specify which one. Um, but a pair of travelers going past that cemetery one time saw a man crawling across the road. The funny part is you can see through his rib cage. The story with that cemetery is at one point, when cars still had running boards on the side, people driving by that cemetery about half a mile away would hear sort of a thump on the side of their car, like somebody jumped onto their running boards. When they got to the cemetery, they would hear the reverse. They would hear somebody uh, jumping off. And uh, they keep driving. So that's, uh, that's Cocalico Valley. I do have a little bit of time, so I'm going to tell a couple of stories from like Chickie's Rock um, and down at uh, Fulton Opera House. These are some of my favorites. Um, Chiki's Rock. Uh, Chiki's Rock is north of Columbia. There are a, a good solid five or six ghost stories associated with it. Um, first, first of all, there was a woman who lived in the vicinity of Chiki's Rock who was evicted from her land. I've never seen why or where or how, but she was removed from her land. Uh, some people say she was a witch, and she is said to have cursed that ground. Um, if you've ever been to Chickie's Rock, again, this might be another one of those stories where if you know the history, you tend to think, well, this is definitely haunted. But it, it can be kind of a creepy place. It's a, it's a Kern Lake County Park. It's beautiful. But it, it's definitely one of the more interesting places we have here in Lancaster County. Um, secondly, Chickie's Rock has a, a, a lover's leap story. Uh, the long and short of it is there was an Indian couple, Native American couple, um, who had gone up to the top of Chickie's Rock after the young man who was a warrior was involved in a, in a battle. Um, the, the Native American girl told 
her would-be suitor, well, I just fell in love with a white farmer who just moved into the area. Um, and that white farmer was kind of in the area to make sure nothing went bad when uh, the girl told the Native American the warrior. So uh, it didn't go over well. Um, the warrior and the farmer got into a struggle. Uh, the warrior stabbed the farmer, threw his body over the, uh, the cliff, and uh, in a fit of um, uh, rage, grabbed the woman and jumped off with her in tow. Um, so the, the story is that you will often see uh, the ghost of the farmer at the top, the ghost of the Indian warrior at the bottom, and you will often hear uh, screams in the <coughs> um, The old railroad tunnel. Uh, this is the old railroad tunnel. This is fairly close to Columbia, actually. It's still within the park, but it's much closer to Columbia. At the, when that tunnel was built, that stretch between the between Chickies Rock and the water, um, there was a lot of activity. It was often called Little Pittsburgh. Um, a lot of iron furnaces, a lot of stuff going on. Well, if you're in an iron furnace, there isn't much to do.